So I want to talk about the Norris Law Hoard of Silver today. This hoard um, is one of the most important early medieval finds from Scotland. Although the majority was lost soon after its discovery in 1819, the surviving portion consists of over 170 objects and fragments of hack silver. There's been an understandable tendency, however, to focus on a small portion of the hoard. This is because it contains some unique objects that have been of interest, great interest to scholars of the period, and partly also because there's currently no full published catalogue, and that's hampered um, discussion of the remainder of the material. The unique symbol decorated silver plaques and um, the symbol decorated silver handpin has meant that the local, in other words, Pictish element of the hoard has dominated published discussion to date. Today, what we want to do is suggest that using work in progress as part of an ongoing project to catalogue and reanalyse the, the rest of the silver, that we can get a far better picture of the hoard and the area and the period more generally by actively seeking to look beyond the local and exploring instead the wider context of this most important find. In particular, what I want to do today, um, time permitting, is begin to situate the hoard in terms of narratives of interaction across Britain and Ireland during the mid-first millennium AD, as well as in trends elsewhere within and beyond the former imperial, uh, uh, imperial frontiers in the first few post-Roman centuries. So as such, this morning what I want to do is begin this process of broadening out the picture of Norris Law Hoard by exploring two main aspects. The first concerns some individual objects from the surviving hoard material. And the second concerns, I suppose, the phenomenon of hoarding precious metal objects and hack silver in the late and post-Roman world more generally. Much of the discussion of both these elements does have implications for, or I would suggest provides a starting point to, date um, the contents of the hoard. And while I'm going to return to that later, it's certainly not going to be the main focus uh, of the paper today as such. <coughs> Before I get into the main body of the hoard, though, I need to just touch quickly on some research, um, some previous findings of the research we've been doing on the hoard, which have a bearing on today's discussion. I'm not going to talk about this in, uh, in detail today, but if anybody wants to ask um, about the reason why we came to this uh, conclusion, they can. Um, this work, which will be published in the forthcoming Insular Art Conference proceedings, um, means that we can now confidently exclude one of the handpins and one of the plaques from the early medieval material in the hoard. Both are demonstrably 19th century copies. Particularly relevant for today is that it's the symbol decorated handpin that we can exclude from the early medieval um, material. And that means that it can, um, I'm going to exclude it from the rest of the discussion of the talk. Together with the removal of one of the silver plaques, it leaves only one legitimate symbol-bearing object amongst the early medieval material in the Norris Law, um, which straight away begins to um, reduce the obviously local component amongst the material. So what I want to do is just begin by profiling some of the objects within the hoard that have connections or distributions that take them beyond a local Pictish context, just so that we can start to begin to widen out our, our, um, uh, the horizons, I suppose. The most well-discussed object with the potential to broaden our perspective of the Norris Law Hoard um, are the two silver handpins, two being one large silver handpin and one tiny one. Um, there's simply not time uh, today to go into detail about the dating or the typology or the interpretation of handpins here. It's an extensive uh, subject with, with very complicated literature. Um, I'm also not going to observe the traditional distinction between proto handpins and handpins in this paper, um, partly because we think we need to re-examine the validity of this typological distinction. And for the purposes of this paper, I'm going to focus on the examples of both that are rendered in silver um, as, as a potentially more meaningful distinction. The consensus is, however, beginning to emerge regarding the dating of many of these silver examples um, following reviews of associated material or context of surviving objects and manufacturing evidence. And this is increasingly pointing to a date in the 4th to 5th um, centuries although the, the traditional 6th to 7th century art historical dating of both the Norris Law and the Gold Cross examples, which is based, I think, partly on the symbol, which we can now exclude, 
um, hasn't yet been fully demolished. Of more importance um, here, perhaps, is the broad distribution of silver handpins, um, which encompasses southern England, um, Scotland, Ireland, as well as one single example recognised uh, on the continent from Hallam Tech in the Netherlands. Um, this distribution starts clearly to point to intriguing but quite poorly understood picture of elite networks across Britain and Ireland around the first millennium AD. But silver handpins aren't alone in this distribution pattern. Um, recent analysis of doorknob spear butts by Andrew Heald provides an interesting parallel to handpins in terms of the distribution of surviving objects, as well as the location um, of surviving uh, manufacture evidence in Scotland, and in their recent redating on the basis of um, carbon-14 dates by several centuries compared with traditional art historical models. So, for instance, a site on Lewis um, has produced moulds for spear butts and handpins, as well as crucibles used for copper alloy and silver working. And so doorknob spear butts provide a potentially contemporary object type with a similarly wide distribution um, stretching across Scotland, Ireland and England with manufactured evidence, manufacturing evidence in Scotland. But in fact, they're not the only type um, that is perhaps worth mentioning. Um, and I think something we'll have to try and do in the future is um, uh, continue to look for other object types, particularly some of the late Roman Iron Age object types drawn together by Fraser Hunter that include massive turrets um, and jet-pegged gaming pieces and other beaded pin variants. They provide a complex situation and no single interpretation is possible, but together they're starting to form quite a rich body of material with which I think in the future we'll be able to compare and contrast the distribution of handpins and which might start to help elucidate wider processes um, affecting and connecting groups in the late Roman and post-Roman Britain and Ireland. Connor Newman and Fiona Gavin's work on silver handpins over the last few years has argued that they should be regarded as insular versions of a much wider late Roman style of metalwork known as military style. This has immediately brought silver handpins into wider discourses um, surrounding the interplay between late Roman and insular native material culture and practices, as well as similar processes of interaction happening elsewhere in the late Roman and post-Roman world. And we can't see any convincing reason to separate the Norris Law and the Gold Cross pins from um, other examples that have been more readily accepted into this narrative. Um, we'd suggest that they're inextricably linked, um, both by their overall design and by specific details, such as the use of um, the uh, circular punch, which I've highlighted on this slide here. One final observation concerning handpins, which I hope will be a theme that pops up throughout this talk. They seem to be one of the few types of non-Roman bronze objects that made a transition to manufacture in um, silver during the 4th and 5th centuries. We think this is a potentially quite interesting phenomenon and one that certainly deserves more attention in the future. And we know that it occurred beyond the insular world, so starting to, to, to explore where and how and why that happened I think will provide some interesting context for, for this process in, in Britain and Ireland. None of the other objects that I'm going to discuss um, just now have quite as wide distribution as the handpins, but each broadens um, our horizon beyond Scotland somewhat uh, and reaches at least one of the other areas covered by the handpins distribution. So the next object we wanted to highlight was the silver spiral finger rings. There's one complete ring from the hoard as well as fragments from at least one other. Spiral finger rings have often been regarded as a very long-lived and therefore quite chronologically insensitive type of object. However, we think it's useful to separate out a meaningful subtype of spiral fingering characterised by both its material, silver, um, and decoration, ribbed or, or worn ribbing that's reduced to nicking on the side, usually only on part of the, the um, spiral. This is based on, on the Norris Law examples. So the distribution of, of silver fingerings of this type that we've identified so far is not as wide as that of the handpins. Um, it's restricted to Scotland and Ireland. Um, so in addition to Norris Law examples, we have um, uh, identified rings from Trepreneur, <coughs> from the Brock of Howe, from Dunmore and from Clickhimmon, and from the National Museum of Ireland, uh, from Newgrange as well. And it's worth saying that other associated uh, stray finds from Newgrange are late Roman 4th and 5th century material. Aside from the distribution, we'd like to suggest that this is another type of object, like handpins, that are making a transition 
from bronze into uh, the new uh, Roman material type of silver. Following on from finger rings are a handful of objects which have been previously discussed um, in relation to material from Ireland. None are exact parallels, um, and that's the nature of a lot of the material in Norrie's law. There are no exact parallels. Um, but the, um, the ones that we have identified nonetheless represent the closest objects we've identified to date. So the spiral decorated plate, um, the function of this object remains unclear and we haven't found a close parallel for it. But in terms of the design and the manufacture technique, um, it's usually been compared with uh, the Monasteverian type of, of bronze discs from Ireland. Um, the dating of these types of bronze discs is, is really unclear and based solely at the moment on our historical models. Um, but again, we wonder on whether, whether we've got um, similar motifs and um, types of object being rendered from bronze into silver here. And again, a possibly similar um, phenomenon with the um, so-called knife bindings from the Norris Law Hoard, the um, cross-hatch decorated strips, which have been previously paralleled by the bronze mounts from the River Shannon in Ireland. And finally, from the point of view of the Irish parallels, Aside from the silver spiral armour in the gold cross hoard, um, which doesn't have the same kind of terminals that the Norris Law example does, um, the closest parallel uh, that we've identified so far are bronze and, ena bronze and enamel um, armour terminals, um, unprovenanced, but from Ireland. They, have, um, they share the quite characteristic sort of um, shape of of the terminals and the sort of cartouche immediately behind it, albeit um, the noise law examples are plain and in silver. Again, we're looking at silver examples of things that are more commonly rendered in bronze elsewhere. So moving away from a, an Irish orientated connection for a minute, where it continues on fragments of what seem to be a Bostrian dish from the surviving noise law hoard material. Um, this dish is not late Roman, it's not a late Roman boss dish. Uh, the Norris Law fragments differ significantly both in their metal analysis um, and also in actually the form and, and, and substance, the substantial weight of, of the late Roman bust examples. Again, we've got no close parallel, and they're unique to Scotland, certainly. Um, we found good parallels amongst bronze dishes um, from the continent that both have similar bust rims but also appear to carry. Um, similar quite ephemeral features on the base, the, the sort of indented circle and scratches across the centre with a hole in the middle. This type of dish, um, as well as being found widely on the continent, is occasionally found in Anglo-Saxon graves, um, as at Fingalsham in Kent, um, but they occur quite widely on the continent. And the majority date from the 5th to the first half of the 6th centuries in continental contexts. Um, and again, a similar date from Anglo-Saxon grave. <coughs> but we've, we've yet to identify an example in silver. So again, do we have a really special dish that's of a type that's more commonly made in bronze? <laughs> Elsewhere in Europe, um, there are examples of the imitation um, of other types, not boss dishes, um, uh, of Roman silver vessels from the second to the fourth centuries. Um, and these have been identified particularly from Denmark. It's not clear at present whether or not this is um, what we've got going on here. Um, and finally, in discussing individual objects from the Norris Law Hoard that are part of at least a wider picture, it's worth mentioning the coins. Um, coins are known to have been found amongst the hoard, but because they were subsequently lost in the 19th century and the 19th century identifications couldn't be <coughs> verified, they tended to be set to one side. But a newly recognised image within the Society of uh, Antiquaries of Scotland's archive um, of some of the lost coins, and we know this image was, was drawn between 1832 and 1838. This provides sufficient detail for the numismatists to identify them uh, reliably. Um, their typical late 4th to early 5th century clipped late Roman soliloquy. Clipped soliloquy are a British phenomenon resulting from the need to manage increasingly limited supplies of silver coinage in the 5th century. While, of course, the Norris Law examples are from beyond the Roman Empire, and therefore you can't apply the sort of standard interpretation um, from elsewhere within the Roman Empire, they nonetheless tie the hoard into a phenomenon that's found across Roman Britain, um, and indeed occurs in the Trane Law Hoard. <coughs> 
And as such, they just provide another means of starting to broaden out the, the context of Norrie's law away from perhaps um, a, a distinctly Pictish uh, interpretation. And incidentally, they give us a terminus plus quem for the horde of after 402 AD. So aside from running through some of the parallels of some of the objects we've started to identify, the other means um, that we wanted to use to widen out the context of Murray's Law concerns the phenomenon of hoarding precious metal objects and hack silver in the late and post Roman world. So, Murray's Law has usually been discussed mm -hmm. as an early medieval hoard that encompasses a late Roman inscribed spoon fragment at one end of the extreme in the dating and a Lindisfarne gospel style Pictish symbol on the plaque at the other. That's the traditional um, interpretation. As a result, it's usually been interpreted as a hoard with a very limited heirloom component that was deposited in the 7th century or even slightly later. And very few, aside from Lloyd Lang, have diverged from that interpretation although he wrongly argued that Norrie's law is mainly composed of Roman silver. Now, we know that's not the case because we've done surface analysis of all the hoard, and that confirms that it's not late Roman silver. The majority is not late Roman silver. But we have identified more pieces beyond the inscribed spoon fragment that do indeed have a late Roman silver signature. While that's no guide to the date of deposition, of course, the results of our re-examination of the hoard are starting to emphasise an increased proportion of material with 5th century associations. However, what I want to say here is, is, is really less important than our dating of the Norris Law Hoard or, or, or our opinions on it. It's really the perspective from which these debates have approached the material in the first place. Here, it seems to us that there's often been a firm divide, a binary opposition between late Roman and early medieval. In other places, and in other places with surviving hordes of hack silver, archaeologists haven't made such a black and white distinction. This is demonstrated by approaches to Danish precious metal hordes, um, which have been recently catalogued and summarised in the Antifreeze uh, volume Late Roman Silver, Training Treasure in Context. These Danish hordes provide quite an interesting parallel to Norrie's law, both in terms of specific comparisons of the material that they contain, but uh, more importantly, the point I want to make here, more generally in the viewpoint from which archaeologists have approached them. In common with the Norrie's law of silver, the Danish hordes are from beyond the former uh, frontiers of, of the empire. Their contents tend to vary widely, but they can include both Roman and native silver, in the form of whole objects, hack silver and coins. Crucially, the ratio of Roman to native objects varies considerably, but crucially, hoards that contain a majority of late Roman silver, those with some late Roman silver, and those with no late Roman silver are approached together as part of a, a hack silver phenomenon stretching from the fourth to seventh centuries. And while continuum perhaps isn't the right word here, as hoarding strategies will undoubtedly have changed um, and will reflect changing circumstances over that period, there's clearly a thread connecting um, the various late and post-Roman Danish hacks of the course. Now, Norrie's law sits very comfortably within this spectrum, comprising as it does um, a small handful of, of late Roman silver, hack silver and coins together with its native hack silver and objects. So we'd like to suggest that comparison with the approach to Danish hordes allows us to draw late Roman hack silver hordes like Trepain Law into our thinking about Norrie's Law, but in a way that doesn't require us to argue that Norrie's Law is late Roman or tie us into a binary distinction between late Roman and early medieval. In many ways, it's not surprising perhaps that this opposition between late Roman and early medieval has emerged particularly in Scotland. Um, because Norrie's Law is the only post-Roman and, and pre-Viking hack silver hoard um, to have survived from Scotland. Perhaps this particular type of hoarding activity didn't persist as long in Scotland as, as elsewhere, but looking beyond Scotland helps situate Norrie's Law in part of a wider context of hoarding strategies on the edges of and beyond the Roman frontier uh, from the 5th century onwards. Chabrain Law and the treasure found there are therefore of relevance to interpreting the Norris Law Hoard. And latest research demonstrates that it was likely to have been buried, the Trepain Law Hoard, that is, um, around the mid-5th century.
But this isn't the limit of the site's relevance because it's produced amongst its non-hoard material objects that have a bearing on, on Murray's Law too. These include um, a silver handpin, as well as, a, interestingly, a tinned copper alloy, perhaps imitation silver handpin, a spiral fingering of the same type, um, a handpin mould, and crucibles used in silver working. Um, and it also might be the time to ponder whether or not this thin uh, bronze plaque on the bottom right might actually be of relevance to interpreting the, the silver plaque from Murray's Law. They're not quite to scale, but they are uh, comparably sized objects. As a site, therefore, Trepain Law has the combination of quantities of late Roman silver uh, buried during the mid-5th century and the presence and manufacture of native object types that made a transition into silver from bronze. Um, so it must be important, Trepain Law must be important and possibly key um, at future attempts to understand the wider networks in Britain and Ireland that are also represented amongst the Norris Law material. And of course, Trepain Law um, produced a massive silver chain. Um, the silver chains have kind of been in the elephant in the room so far in a paper on postural and Scottish silver. Um, sadly, they're a type of object that entirely lacks independent dating evidence. And perhaps um, we'd suggest in common with Norris Law Hoard, their interpretation has been a bit shackled by the presence of a couple of Pictish symbols. Evaluation of the style of a symbol has been used to link the plaque and the symbol decorated chains and to estimate a date around about the 7th century. But what we'd like to suggest is that the Norris Law plaque and the decorated chain terminals are more forcefully linked. What, what links the Norris Law plaque and the symbol decorated terminals also more forcefully links them to the 5th century material discussed so far. That is, the technology involved in and the visual effect from combining silver and, and red enamel. Uh, the combination of what's been called the fine line style of the ornament and the quality of decoration, as well as some of the motifs involved. So, if I begin to move to some conclusions, and apologies, this has been a somewhat of a gallop through um, quite a lot of material. At a basic level, the surviving portion of the Norris Law Hoard is, seems to be made up of in incredibly rare silver objects. Some of types that are more commonly found in bronze, others are impossible to parallel closely in any medium. It seems to be a collection of unusual things, potentially drawn from quite a wide area, including Britain and Ireland and perhaps the continent too. Are they rare objects because they were versions in silver and therefore were made in more restricted numbers to start with, perhaps? Or are they rare because silver versions uh, were more commonly recycled and thus just haven't survived in, in as great numbers as bronze examples? This is the only hoard of its kind and we would suggest date from Scotland with the possible exception of the gold cross hoard, which I think necessarily means we will struggle to parallel some of the objects within it. But the apparent rendering of select types of bronze objects into this new material of silver, the insular participation in and manipulation of a late Roman military style, and the combining of Roman and native silver objects as well as hacked silver, all help situate Norris Law and related silver and material in a wider post-Roman European context. This represents a shift in the attitude to Norris Law Hoard that asks us to look beyond a few well-known objects um, at the rest of the material. It also requires that we reassess our approach to the relationship between late Roman and early medieval, both the period and the material, particularly when it comes to the phenomenon of pack silver hoarding. The gathering together of the Norris Law hack silver clearly links it um, to hoards of exclusively late Roman silver, such as Trepain Law, as well as mixed Roman and native hoards from elsewhere beyond the imperial frontiers. We'd like to suggest that by shifting our perspective on the hoard, we can begin to situate it in the context of various strategies of forming and reforming elite identities during the centuries following the end of the Roman Empire. There's just a few thank yous. Thanks.